welcome to the Art School Podcast. I'm Ken Goshen. Today's topic is realism, and not the kind of realism I talk about in every episode, but the actual development of the term, the tradition, what it meant for different painters in different times, and ways to think about it today. Very importantly, we also discuss why detail is the enemy of experience, and how Courbet was basically a troll. Stay tuned. Today, we are very fortunate to have the great Ilya Gefter back on the podcast. I introduced Ilya when he last came on the show, which was episode eight. And in that episode, we spoke about his work and his process. So make sure you listen to that episode as well. Ilya offered to come back to discuss some larger themes in art and culture. And of course, I was very excited about this idea. So this is the first in what I hope will become a series of conversations with Ilya that are more big picture. No pun intended. If you enjoy this episode and you want us to do more of these, make sure you follow Ilya on Instagram at iliageftel.art and the rest of his social media pages, which I'll list in the show notes. Send some love his way and let him know that you enjoyed his appearance on this podcast, and hopefully we will lure him back for more. And if you want more of me, please visit patreon.com slash Ken Goshen and sign up as a patron. In the past, I used to say that this is how you'll be supporting the show. And then I would say that if you're interested in my lessons, you can visit kengoshen.com slash lessons. And you can still do that. And you'll see that page on my website with the layout of all my lessons. But when you click on a collection, you will now land back on my Patreon. Do you know what this means? It means that thanks to all the people who signed up to support me on Patreon, I was able to move my whole educational model to Patreon. And why is that cool? Well, because it makes my lessons much more affordable and accessible to anyone who wants to learn all over the world. This past August, September, and now in October, my Patreon supporters have been getting four live lessons per month for the price of $2. That's a quarter per live painting lesson where you get to watch and hear me explain my every move, ask me any question you want, a quarter. And supporters in the $10 level also get access to a video archive of past lessons. There's over 150 hours of video content already up, and more videos are added every month. All of this is brought to you by the many supporters who signed up in August and September, to whom I'm deeply, deeply grateful. Though I must tell you, we are still far from making this sustainable. So hopefully more of you will decide to join the team in October. The more people sign up, the more I am able to focus on producing these programs and making them available almost for free, or in the case of this podcast, literally for free. So if you want to study with me, or if you want to support my mission of making art education affordable and accessible, please visit patreon.com slash Ken Goshen and become a supporter of the show. Thanks again to everyone who signed up. It's people like you who make all of this possible. And now I bring you my conversation with Ilya Gefter. So, Ilya, thank you so much for taking the time to come back on the podcast. Thank you, Ken. Thank you for inviting me. It's good to see you. I am waiting for the day when we'll see each other in person again. In the meantime, it's uh, wonderful to communicate about art via all this wonderful technology. Oh, I feel the exact same way. And today, I think we touch on a subject that is near and dear to both our hearts, the subject of realism. It is a big term, big word. People throw it around very often, but people mean different things when they use this word. And the historical context around this word, not a lot of people are aware of it. So today we're going to try to clear up the mess and hopefully create some new mess. We'll see how it goes. <laughs> so maybe you can start by telling us, why is there so much confusion about this word? Like, what is going on with it? Um, well, first, painting is not about words. It's, a, it's, a, it's about... Uh, direct experience. We uh, my, the painting, uh, the paintings that, that I love most are the paintings that leave me speechless and uh, and uh, provoke no desire with, within me to talk about them too much. Uh, however, as an art teacher, as a lecturer, uh, and uh, you're in the same position as I am, more or less, uh, we have to communicate about art verbally. When we start to communicate about art verbally, we do it with the idea that our communication will improve and hopefully will um, enrich people's direct nonverbal experience of art. Uh, that's what the whole idea of art, uh, art lecturing is, is for me. Uh, now, when 
we resort to words, we have to be very, very careful about their meaning and make sure that we are on the same page and mean the same thing using this or that terminology. So uh, if, uh, let's say, we do an experiment and uh, wherever we live, uh, we leave our apartments, our studios, uh, we go to the nearest uh, shopping center or convenience store and we ask people, uh, well, what do you think is realism in art? Um, the pe uh, uh, people who are not artists, uh, not art lovers, not uh, museum goers will have a very, very particular idea when we throw around the term realism. Um, uh, for uh, the majority of people um, uh, uh, looking at a painting that looks like a photograph is an equivalent of looking at a realist painting. Now, uh, for me as a painter and for many, many colleagues I know, uh, it couldn't be more different. Um, a painting that looks like a photograph is not necessarily realist and painting that is far removed from how photographs look uh, can on occasions be considered as highly realist by some. Uh, now for us in today's world, uh, let's say um, the word realism means very, very different thing as opposed to what the same word meant to painters in the 19th century. Mm -hmm. Which is when it started really being used. Uh, I think as far as far as I know, the term realism uh, as it applied uh, as applied to painting uh, showed up in the 19th century. Mm -hmm. uh, the word itself is far more ancient, but it was not used so much in the context of visual arts. When we talk about realism in the 19th century, we speak predominantly about Courbet. Mm -hmm. um, and if I'm not mistaken, he uh, he proclaimed himself, proudly proclaimed himself as the realist uh, painter. Um, uh, now, uh, no, no one works in isolation, uh, and uh, there were many other artists beyond Courbet who uh, were sympathetic to his cause. Now, for those artists, uh, Courbet included, of course, realism was not so much of a stylistic idea. It was uh, more of a proclamation of a preference for a certain theme. Mm. Uh, uh, so um, if we compare the work of uh, Gustave Courbet to, um, to the paintings of uh, more academic painters of the time, uh, one of the... Uh, major differences that the 19th century public saw is the difference of theme. Uh, Courbet wanted to paint uh, the life around him. He wanted to paint the peasants, he wanted to paint the working class, uh, and he was far less interested in um, uh, exotic themes uh, like um, lion hunts in Morocco, which is something that a painter like Delacroix would love to paint, uh, or uh, he would be far less interested in uh, classical subject from Greek, uh, Greco-Roman mythology, which is something that many, many painters uh, adored at the time and public was quite hungry for that. Um, if we look uh, at the execution of the paintings, uh, how they were made, uh, we I, I can't say that Courbet is more detailed uh, or has more technical finesse than uh, the painters who are not considered realist in the 19th century, like uh, uh, like. Um, a, uh, be it uh, Bougereau or uh, Delacroix or um, a, uh, um, uh, Jacques Louis David, and so forth and so on. Uh, these painters were as technically advanced. They had uh, the same, more or less, the same academic training, and the main uh, difference was uh, the preference for this or that subject matter. Mm. Now, having, having, having said that, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the work of Courbet also looks different. 
but on many occasions it actually looks rougher it's painted rougher than the work of non-realist painters who are uh, who can be way more detailed who uh, can apply paint in a far uh, more a uh, well-mannered way a sleeker way that's interesting because uh, I totally agree. And also, to me, uh, the self-proclamation of Courbet as, as realist, uh, as opposed to his contemporaries, whom, as you say, were very, very skilled and were painting things that could you could, you could say look even more like, quote-unquote, real life than Courbet did. But I think he almost did it as a kind of, uh, uh, pardon me for using this word, but it's almost like a kind of trolling because these, these people were constantly busy one-upping each other. And he almost, by using that word, is doing something like saying, you guys are painting fantasies. Jacques-Louis David, all your stories from ancient Greece, that's nice. Delacroix, I'm digging the lions, but that's not real. Don't get me started about Eng, who paints people who look like sculptures. I'm painting the real stuff, the dirt, you know, and, and people working in the fields. And, 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 and these people, to some extent, uh, there, there is a ruggedness to their day-to-day -day experience that Courbet is actually trying to bring into the way that he makes his paintings. So for him, making the paintings look rough in terms of their brushwork, application, design, is actually closer to quote-unquote representing real life than actually polishing everything to a supreme level of sublime beauty. He says all this polishing takes it away from the realism and actually puts it in a in a land of uh, visual fantasy. Does that ring true? Absolutely. I I, I couldn't uh, I couldn't say it better. Um, uh, and on 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 one hand, uh, it removes uh, the paintings of Courbet from what we now see in photography, which is a very very uh, sleek and detailed surface. Uh, the surfaces of Courbet are way rougher, but that only enhances the sense of reality on both conceptual and experiential level, because the roughness of paint in a Courbet uh, is not just uh, trolling and proclamation. It's, it may also be that, of course, but it's also an emphasis uh, of the reality of the painting itself. And so he's saying here, I am, I'm a proud artist, I'm a user or proud painter, I'm using paint in a fairly rough manner. Uh, here, look at that. And this um, commitment and uh, uh, directness with the material uh, is, uh, in my opinion, uh, giving the paintings a particular kind of physical presence that um, uh, I experience far less in work like someone uh, like Bougeron. Mm -hmm. And I think I think there's a really interesting uh, kind of like cate categorization that's starting to emerge around the word realism. So there is realism, meaning looks like reality. And then there is mm -hmm. realism. It's about reality. Then there is realism feels like reality. And these things are sometimes in conflict. Like, let's just take the most direct example that we've been talking about. If Courbet says reality is rough and rugged, hence paint needs to be rough and rugged in order to feel like reality, this is sometimes in direct contradiction to look like reality. Uh, also, like if we look at the work of somebody like Bougaro, that feels like a window that you can kind of walk through and enter that, that domain, right? So looks like reality is a little bit in conflict with feels like reality and both of them have a claim to the broad term called realism mm -hmm. um i uh agree with some things you've said and uh, i uh, differ on other aspects of your um statements um i definitely feel that realism can uh, the idea of realism can be applied to different levels of painting uh well we can say that well it uh realism may be a representation that looks like reality, realism may be a representation that feels like reality, uh, and so forth and so on. So there, 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 is, there can be a distinction how we use the same term uh, as uh, professionals communicating to each other. Um, now, if we uh, isolate the idea of 
paintings looking like reality, then uh, the question, the immediate question I would have to ask myself is, well, what does reality look like? Mm -hmm. Do we really know? Uh, we have to look really, really hard at reality to discover that the same scene, the same object on a table can appear to us in many, many different manifest visual manifestations. Um, so uh, if we go back to uh, Bougereau, um, I don't, personally, I don't feel that his works look like reality. They are very uh, skillfully executed, um, really uh, astounding, astounding uh, technical finesse and astounding sense of composition, tradition, and so forth and so on. Uh, but they don't look like reality. They, they look like um, soft uh, sculpture, uh, soft colored sculptures. Mm -hmm. um, they, they are very, very conceptual in a way because his, his idea of how the figure should look and how the compositions should look uh, may be far removed from how um, people uh, look in real life and how, uh, how we experience the world as a whole with all its uh, arbitrary elements. So I think even if we talk about how reality looks, looks uh, Courbet, despite his greater roughness, uh, to me at least, comes close uh so that the, um yeah these the, these are my two cents about how reality looks to us um and that's that's a big question do we really know and will reality always look the same way to all of us all the time oh i feel like this opens the door to so many interesting points but i feel like before we before we get into the deep water maybe we should touch base with something that you said that reality kind of looks different to each each and every one of us and perhaps even the same person in a different day could see reality differently I want to kind of bring it back to layman's terms so if I'm mm -hmm. just a casual person in a that that we you said we met in a shopping mall and you asked me mm -hmm. what realism is and I give you the answer well, you know, take, take your phone out, take a photo. That's, re that's how reality looks like. I can see it clear as day in the pixels on my phone. Why, why is that an incomplete picture? Um, well, we, uh, I believe that uh, we do not necessarily experience reality directly. Mm. Uh, reality is way too complex. There's so much stuff going on and there's so much stuff that I uh, know nothing about. Uh, so we uh, have to make sense of what we see around us. We simplify reality to a tremendous degree. And uh, we have a bunch of cultural filters uh, to, uh, to experience reality. So let's, uh, so our smartphones is the filter of today's world, or the computer screens, uh, or uh, posters, uh, any printed photograph, uh, or a um, digital photograph on any screen. These are our filters. We um, look at reality through them. Um, so uh, let's say, let's say if we if we could revive um, a uh, a commoner from the Renaissance. Uh, for that person, the, uh, the reality was seen through a completely different filter. Let's say the Renaissance paintings, uh, the uh, mosaics, uh, the frescoes. Uh, so so, so uh, the arch, the, 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 um, let's say in, in, in the Renaissance, they didn't use the word realism the way we do, but uh, they, uh, they used, let's say, they used the word truth. They wanted paintings to look like life, and they, 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 they used the, the word truthfulness. Um, and uh, the, for, uh, for them, the greatest accomplishments of that truthfulness do not look like reality to us, because we are seeing the same reality through a very, very different filter. Uh, now, does the filter itself look like reality? Absolutely not. It imposes on us an idea of how reality looks. Mm. 
uh, so so in in a way, uh, it's not necessarily a bad thing because it's inevitable. Uh, we 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 reality is way too complex. Uh, so if uh, if I spend half my day staring at my iPhone, uh, then of course when I look at the landscape, um, I will be influenced by that. I think. Well, first of all, I agree with everything you said. And, and the whole idea of, of cultural filters, cultural visual filters is, is super interesting and profound. I want to take us one level lower by actually just, mm -hmm. just kind of proving the point to, to people who are still on the side of saying, listen, man, this all sounds philosophical and deep, and I appreciate all the big words, but I take a photo of a tree, it looks like a tree. So to those people, I will say, think about everybody has a similar experience to this. Let's say you want to take a photo of your friend and behind your friend, there is a sunset. You stand in front of this vision and you're, you're, you're really shocked by how beautiful it is to see, to see this backlit situation with a beautiful sunset and you see your, your friend's face fully. Take out a, photograph, a, a, a pho photographing device, you know, your smartphone and try to take that photograph. What you get is your friend is a complete silhouette, total shadow, mm -hmm. and the mm -hmm. sun is not a beautiful combination of reds, oranges, or, or whatever the sunset is. It's a, it's a white bulb, right? So just on a very basic thing, we have to develop to cultivate a distrust of the photographic device. We have too much faith in that machine, thinking that when we point it at something, it's going to capture the way that our eye sees the world. And it doesn't deserve that credit, because under so many circumstances, it just simply fails. Now, this This is an obvious example of, of when it fails, but it should inform our general view of photography, knowing that even, even if it's not such an explicit example, this, this photographic device has preferences. It's making decisions about how it's going to um, convert the unending visual information in front of it into a simple arrangement of pixels. And this is already, it's what you're calling a filter. Right? It's taking a reality that is too big to capture, way too big to capture by any machine, and you know, pretends to capture it. And we just need to know, okay, the, this, this, this device captures some of reality, but definitely not the whole thing. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. And, uh, the same is true about painting. Uh, a painting doesn't capture the reality in its entirety. It's, uh, uh, it's, it's also, if, uh, in painting, we also filter reality. And, um, uh, or it, we may use the word uh, reduce uh, or filter reduce uh, what we are exposed to. So let's say if we, uh, just as an example, if um, uh, let's say you read the Divine Comedy and uh, or a bunch of people read the Divine Com uh, Comedy And uh, every one of, uh, of, the, uh, of those individual is given a task to tell what's, what it is about in two or three sentences. So uh, the text is the same to all of us, but our uh, description, our shorthand description of the text will be very, very different because we have to reduce such a complex phenomenon, such, such a complex literary structure To, uh, to a few words. So uh, uh, let's say, uh, so every one of us will isolate different elements, different ideas. And this is uh, what our interaction uh, with reality is like, both as photographers, painters, and viewers. Uh, we look at reality and we capture a very, very um, uh, small fragment of it or a very, very uh, narrow aspect of what it is. And, uh, and uh, try to uh, make it work. So uh, uh, photographs, of course, have their own uh, vision, so to speak. They have their uh, technological limitations that capture reality in a certain way. And of course, it's very, very different from what our eyes can see and experience. Mm. Uh, so if so uh, now that's a that's a given we it, and and it can be a very uh, limiting thing because if we are not approaching reality with a sufficient degree of curiosity we will not discover the tremendous richness of 
uh, visual information and the tremendous richness of experience beyond what we are familiar with uh, from printed photographs or from the screens. Mm. I think this uh, this kind of leads us towards uh, towards uh, the, the topic of hyperrealism, perhaps, because there are few painters uh, for whom they say, okay, listen, this is, this is, it's nice and all that we can see things with our eyes, but the cameras are stronger, you know, it sees more things. Mm -hmm. And if the camera sees more things, then, then, then that informs us um, visually in, in a way that's worth depicting. So for example, if you compare the work of someone like Iga Lozeri um, to someone like Velasquez, right? You could say, mm -hmm. oh, Iga Lozeri is, is way more realistic because he paints all the things that are really there because he paints all the fingernails and he paints the eyelashes and he paints all the text on the street signs. When Velasquez, you know, you come up close to, to a Velasquez portrait, there are no eyelashes, there are barely eyes, you know, fingers blend together. And yet, you know, I would assert that the Velasquez picture is more realistic, but that, that might be my own personal preference, but I, I can see how I'm bumping up against definitions that are, that are hard to object. So maybe, maybe you give us your take on these, uh, on these two painters and how they relate. Mm, uh, well, I, I, it's, uh, it's really hard to compare uh, um, Igal Dozeri or most hyper-realist paintings to Velasquez because uh, Velasquez is in a completely different uh, universe uh, culturally, and in my opinion, also in terms of uh, depth and quality. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, sorry for being somewhat categorical. About no, no, no. I, 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 uh, I agree 100%. But what I want you to do is this. Mm -hmm. Take us over to your side. I'm already on your side. But <laughs> okay. all, all the people mm -hmm. listening and looking mm -hmm. at Velasquez and say, I don't get why he didn't paint the fingerprints like this, that the, fi the, the fingernails, like this painting mm -hmm. is incomplete. Try to bring mm -hmm. us over to the side where we stand and say, no, that is actually desirable. And that feels more like life. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, yes, in, in the same fashion, I can, we can ask uh, some, uh, we can stand in front of a hyper-realist painting and ask, well, why is all this stuff painted? So we, 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 uh, some, some, uh, we, we can look at a certain painting and ask, well, why uh, is th this particular detail isn't there? Uh, in the same way, uh, we can look at any work of art and ask, well, why is this detail there? Is there a justification for its existence in the painting? Now, uh, but let's let's uh, let's go back a little bit. And you brought up uh, you brought up a few examples. So let's say if we take a photograph of a tree, you said it looks like a tree. Um, uh, and if we look at a hyper realist painting, though, and it looks like reality. Well, not always, and not necessarily. Um, it may, a, a, photo, a, a photograph may look like a tree, a hyper-realist portrait may look like the person who is depicted, uh, but, but, or may not. Uh, there is uh, a difference between uh, recognizing something and seeing something. Mm. So let's say if I look at a photograph of a tree, I recognize that it is a photograph of this particular tree. And if the photograph is in really high resolution, I can uh, easily identify what kind of tree it is, and I can learn all sorts of things about the textures and the structure of the leaf and uh, maybe some parasites uh, that uh, live on that tree and eat it up and so forth and so on. But these are all recognitions. We uh, look at um, a flat a doom dimensional representation and we recognize it uh, for what it is and for uh, and we recognize all the information that it provides us with. Now it does not necessarily mean that it looks like the thing. Now what does a tree look like? Um, I don't know. Uh, I think in many ways it depends on what I look for. Mm. So for, for example, if, um, uh, if I am um, uh, a zoology student and let's say I'm stu studying insects, okay? Uh, a tree looks, appears to me in one way. Uh, if uh, I'm uh, um, taking 
a uh, class on botanics, the tree looks in a different way because I look for different things. Um, let's say if I am a poet writing about the forest, then it's a completely different tree. It's not the same thing. I'm, I'm because I'm, I'm as a poet, I would be looking for different things as um, standing in front of that tree. Now, uh, uh, I'm neither of those, I am a painter. And as a painter, I can choose to see the tree in many different ways. And in this uh, respect, I think we can connect the idea of what the thing looks like to how the thing feels mm -hmm. and make them one. So let's say, let's say that I'm painting the tree, uh, but, as a, but I'm an impressionist painter. Mm -hmm. okay? So as an impressionist painter, uh, uh, the, uh, not myself necessarily, but an impressionist painter would be far less interested in the texture of the tree and would be far more interested in uh, how the tree is illuminated and mm -hmm. what kind, uh, what kind, what what uh, time of day it is, what kind of weather it is, and so forth and so on. So, uh, are impressionist painting paintings realist? To me, absolutely, they are the most realistic representations of um, uh, of um, visual phenomena like color and atmosphere and illumination. Uh, are they realist in um, in an informative way, do, do, do they tell me anything about the texture of the tree trunk? Not so much. Okay? Mm. Um, now, let's say if we look at another painter, let's say, um, um, let's say a classically trained draftsman who is doing a drawing of a tree. Uh, now, for, for, uh, for that uh, kind of task, the artist would look at the three dimensionality of the tree and would try to express the uh, uh, the physical uh, uh, the physical tactile uh, presence of that tree trunk. And is it realist? Yes, of course it may be, but it but 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 it's a different uh, aspect of reality. It's a different experience of reality. So we can choose what to look for, and as long as this looking for is communicating with what's in front of us, we can have very, very different stylistic representations of the same thing hmm. um, that uh, deal with this or that aspect of what reality is. Okay. It, okay. So much, so much to go on there. Um, I just, I just want to also add, there's a dimension. There, okay. There's a myth that I'm here to bust. Okay. There's mm -hmm. a myth that the more detailed something is, the more realistic it is. And I have a great, I think, great, uh, you guys will let me know, uh, example for why this isn't the case. And let us imagine what it feels like to look at the moon. When we look mm -hmm. at the moon, uh, the way that it charms us and, 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 you know, inspires us, the beauty of the moon lies, I think, in looking at the moon, lies in the fact that we don't see it with all the details, like it's far away from us, ambiguous, and therefore, mm -hmm. you know, and that is the real experience, real capital, real experience of looking at the mm -hmm. moon. Then you compare that to a high resolution scan by NASA, right? You take that, they have the craziest cameras on these satellites. They take photos of the moon where you can see every crack on the surface, every tiny little pebble, every crater, and usually seeing that, you have to read the article that says this is actually a photo of the moon because you wouldn't <laughs> recognize it. If you see mm -hmm. that thing close up, you're like, what, what is this? This is something, this is an object I've never seen in my life. And then, you know, the article headline is new photos of the moon reveal blah, 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 blah. And it's like mm -hmm. the more detailed that photograph becomes, the farther away it is from our real perception of the moon. So we have to understand, I think, from this example that ambiguity and lack of details is actually, in, in many cases, truer to our real perception of the world. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. We, uh, we uh, are seeing the world in very, very low resolution unless we focus on something. So let's say if, as I'm talking to you, if I focus on my uh, new microphone, um, 
uh, I will see that microphone with all its detail, but everything else uh, will be in very, very low re resolution to an extent that I will not see my room behind the photo, uh, behind the, uh, the microphone, or I will not uh, see uh, you on the screen. I will only see one thing in high resolution and everything else will be a blur. Um, so the, 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 uh, for the most part, this is how we see things, or we may see them, uh, or we may see everything as a blur. We never see everything in high resolution. Uh, so therefore, hyperrealist paintings are far, far removed from uh, how we actually see the world. Now, there is, uh, so, okay, so uh, this is, let's say, we can talk about how we see the world. Um, and uh, another question is, well, we painted a painting, and does it look real? Um, and uh, then we should ask ourselves, what is real? What is reality? Let's say if we go back to the uh, to the example of the tree, um, the textures of the tree trunk. Yes, that's a part of reality. Um, is the three dimensionality of the tree trunk a part of the reality of the tree? Absolutely. Is the air around the tree trunk a part of reality? Absolutely. Yes. Is the sunlight on the tree a part of reality? Yes. It's a yes to all these questions. So reality is many, many things. Now, uh, what I've learned from uh, um, my teacher, Mark Carnes, is that in most cases, in the vast majority of cases, details are an enemy of experience. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, I remember his words uh, to this day from, the, from uh, I think, well, almost 20 years ago when I studied with him, he said that detail is an enemy of light. So the more uh, details you paint, um, the in most cases, the less prominent will be the experience of light as, uh, as conveyed by the painting. So your example of the moon is in fact really perfect. Okay? The more uh, details we see or paint on the moon, the less uh, affected we are by the uh, light it uh, casts on the nightscape. Mm -hmm. uh, so we really, now, if our painting is about the reality of the texture, eh, yes, in some cases, you may want more uh, information in some cases. But uh, if you uh, want to attain any other experience of reality, in your work uh, beyond the texture, like three-dimensionality, like space, like illumination, uh, detail uh, will inevitably stand in our way. Why is that? Uh, because we lose a sense of the whole. Mm. Why is the, that? Uh, because when we paint details, we have to look at details. Mm. And when I paint, so let's say I paint the room I'm sitting in. Uh, if I, uh, and I'm not painting a still life over the microphone, I'm painting, that's, let's say I'm painting the entire room. In order to paint the microphone in a detailed way, I look at the microphone, okay? And if I want to paint the sofa behind the microphone in a detailed way, I have to look at a sofa. Is it one experience? Absolutely not. These are two very, very different experiences. So mm. I, me looking at the microphone and me looking at the sofa. And then the painting does not become a reality, it becomes a collage, a collage of one snapshot, me looking at the microphone, let's call it, a, let's, uh, let's say, uh, my, uh, my uh, biochemical uh, digital, my, my biochemical camera. Mm -hmm. uh, looking at the microphone, that's one snapshot. And my eyes staring at the sofa, that's another snapshot. And then I glue them together. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and, and, let, and then if I say, if I paint the table and the mess on the table uh, around the microphone, then it's a bunch of additional snapshots that, uh, that I paste, that I keep on pasting into the uh, collage that my painting becomes. So yes, all these things will be depicted in a detailed way, but guess what? Uh, will I, convey a sense of distance between those objects? Most likely not. 
interesting. This brings us back to brings us back to Velasquez a little bit. And essentially what you're saying is when I look a person in the eyes, I don't see their fingernails. Mm-hmm. Uh, that, so, so it's actually more true to reality to say we can only see ver- a very set, a very limited number of things in, in focus simultaneously. It's, uh, it's a limitation that we have biologically and is closer to a kind of consensus of reality even if we say everybody may look at reality and see it a little bit differently, this is a kind of consensus that we can't see everything detailed at the same time. And when a camera, a camera comes to supplement our visual understanding of a subject by letting us see all the details, we have been conditioned to think that looks realistic because we are saturated with photography in our day-to-day life. But in fact, our eyes are way simpler and way more profound uh, in certain ways. And, and, and I think I, this is this is this is also something that that I like harping on. It's kind of like you you have this experience, I have this experience. You walk around the classroom and you you tell a student, listen, there's so much information in this shadow. Like keep it keep it simpler. And then that person would say to you, Ilya, but but I see it. I I, I see it right there in in the shadow. And what I usually tell the students uh, when I when I get this answer is, imagine that you you know you walk into a dark room and you close the door. Initially, you see nothing. You see nothing, but after five minutes, your eyes adjust and suddenly you see all the different, you see the table, you see the chair. What happened there is our our pupil expanded to let more light in, adjusting the whole visual experience around us. And suddenly we can see things that previously we couldn't see. So if you look at a shadow for a second, you're going to see nothing. You stare at it for five minutes, our eyes adjust, let more light in, and suddenly all this information emerges. But as you say, this information is of great detriment to, to the feeling of completeness around the painting, because as you beautifully explained, this would mean that I have a different set of uh, visual, um, how would you call it? Like our vision has adapted to looking at the shadow. So we have a picture of the shadow, then you stare at the light and, and then the eye does the opposite thing. You know, initially the, the light is blinding, but in this case, it's going to uh, the pupil is going to contract to let less light in so that we're not blinded by the light. And then suddenly we see all the little di- details and dimples and all the light masses. And then we make a different painting of the light. And this painting of the light and this painting of the shadow, they don't cohere to the same painting of the same visual experience because our eye has adjusted. Our, hi- our eye has, has literally changed the value range uh, in order to accommodate all this unnecessary information. So what maybe are, maybe we'll, we'll, we'll jump a little bit to the practical. What are some tips that could help aspiring painters avoid these pitfalls? Because everybody is extremely tempted to draw all these details that they see. And how do we help them understand which details they need and which details are unnecessary? Um, um. Well, it, it, uh, the recommendation would, uh, would have to be very personalized. I don't, I, it's very hard to give one recommendation to anyone. Um, if we, if we uh, take painting to uh, uh, painting, the, if we take the process of painting to a more conceptual level, I would recognize, uh, I would re- recommend to eliminate the idea of detail altogether Hmm. to eliminate the idea of detail there is no such thing okay not not in a painting not in a good painting um paint a good painting uh, or a healthy painting process aspires to um create uh a result a picture that looks whole so um uh, in, in the painting process, we should aim for wholeness, uh, for unity, uh, for the unity of experience, for the clarity of experience. So uh, let's say if I, uh, going back to the, the example of a dream, if I'm a re- impressionist painter, uh, I would uh, try to create a very total and a unified experience of a particular kind of light. Um, uh, if uh, let's say I'm a gestural art, uh, draftsman, 
let's say, I, 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 I would try to depict the motion of the tree, how the tree grows, uh, how the tree um, is affected by the wind, let's say. Okay, so, so and, and I want to have a wholeness of, to convey a wholeness of that experience um, in the most eloquent uh, fashion, visually eloquent fashion. So uh, no matter what approach I adopt, no matter what my pictorial aim is, uh, detail will always stay in the weights. It's never about detail uh, because detail is not truth, it's information. Uh, if we want truth in a painting, we have to uh, look beyond information and try to figure out how we convey experience by visual methods. Mm. Now, and that's the paradoxical aspect of painting. In order to convey experience, in order for the experience to, uh, as it is conveyed by the painting, to feel true, we have to get rid of a tremendous amount of information. Mm -hmm. um, I... Sorry, go ahead. No, I was I was just gonna. I didn't. Uh, I was just gonna add that. Um, maybe one very basic tool that, that people can use, I think, uh, is squinting. I think that's super useful in this case uh, for, for actually reducing reality to its bare minimum, right? People, people who, who are, who are uh, just learning how to paint, we have this idea that we need to really concentrate our eyes and, and focus on seeing all the tiny little things. But, but in fact, if you're, if you're there, I, I invite you to try squinting for a month and only paint the way that life looks like when you're squinting, because what gets, I think, if you may disagree, but I think the mm -hmm. kind of reality that, that gets produced that way is, uh, is usually a pretty good summary of the bare minimum necessary to create mm -hmm. a, 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 an experience that feels like reality. And then mm -hmm. later you can say, okay, so mm -hmm. now I can choose a few areas to focus on. And, and then you have to think about it, I think, through the lens of design. Like where in the frame should we have a few areas that are a little bit more focused, but in general, uh, the rest needs to be pretty simplified. And I think squinting is a good tool for that. Uh, absolutely. This is a fundamental tool. Uh, this is, it's essential for uh, uh, beginners and um, for, also for myself, uh, for most painters, it's a very, very essential tool. Um, it's, uh, it's not the only one uh, because, because uh, squinting in a way, uh, re uh, squinting reduces uh, uh, a great, uh, re the information that we see, which is a great thing, um, but it also has other effects. Uh, so for example, when we squint, we see color far less clearly. Mm -hmm. we, we, we see tones more, we see color less. So uh, for, um, uh, for some painters who are looking uh, to, let's say, depict the color of the shadow, uh, squinting would be a little bit less useful, but uh, squinting is absolutely essential for everyone to learn the art of reduction. Mm. Um, a, uh, when 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 uh, some really really advanced uh, painters may not squint that much, let's say if I look at a painting by Cezanne, I'm not sure if he squinted that often. <laughs> right. Well, that, that actually brings up a really interesting question, I think. So you, you quickly alluded to the fact that you consider uh, Impressionist painting to be fully in the tradition of, of realism. And you said, is it, is it realistic? Absolutely. But I wonder what you would think, or maybe I misunderstood, but I wonder what you would mm -hmm. think about Courbet's opinion on the Impressionists, right? Because Courbet could look at the Impressionists and say, you guys are also in some kind of color fantasy land like you're drunk on light reality is right here in the dirt so how do we negotiate this issue mm -hmm, mm -hmm. uh well i i'm not sure there really is one tradition of realism mm -hmm. there is one word uh but there is no one tradition behind it uh so uh to me courbet uh is a, is a very very fine example of looking at certain aspects of reality 
uh, while impressionists were interested in a completely different aspects of reality, I think that uh, some uh, works by Monet, M-O-N-E-T, uh, from uh, the uh, 70s and 80s of the uh, 19th century, these are the most profound examples of uh, realist paintings that deal with light and atmosphere. Uh, uh, now, in, in, uh, if uh, Courbet wasn't so interested in that, so of course uh, there would be um, uh, a conflict of um, uh, not so much a conflict of tastes, but a conflict of worldviews, mm. uh, um, and and uh, that's uh, that's uh, uh, th that's a. <laughs> That's something that is really specific to, to good painting. We are not very liberal. Uh, good mm. painters are not uh, very liberal because, because we always have to choose what aspect of reality we are interested in. And, we, and therefore, we would be less interested in other aspects of reality. Mm. Now, uh, Courbet was not a very polite guy, as far as I know. So, uh, so he could um, uh, he could, uh, as you said, uh, troll other painters. But uh, if we remove and like for us, it's very re easy uh, to remove ourselves from that social uh, structure and the and their interpersonal interactions, and we can say, well, this is a great painting and this is a great painting, but they dealt with very very different. Um, uh, worldviews. Mm. There's a there's a devil advocate position that is uh, waiting to creep in here. Basically, what I'm what I'm hearing is both of these people could be considered realists because both of them dealt with different aspects of reality, and they did so honestly. And who are we to say what aspect of reality is more meritorious as a subject for painting? But another aspect of reality is our internal feelings, right? So we can take somebody like Matisse who looked inwards at reality and said, this is how I feel and my feelings are going to inform my color decisions. Uh, so somebody like, like Bonnard, somebody like Matisse, somebody even like Klimt. So mm -hmm. are they equally realistic? Uh, because, you know, feelings are real. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I think you're, we are taking the conversation into a more philosophical realm. Uh, and I don't know. Uh, I don't know. Um, you see, the, uh, beyond a painter's honesty, uh, it's a question of painter's uh, power. Mm. Uh, and what do I mean by power? Let's say impressionist paintings had a tremendous amount of power. They affected the way we see the world. Uh, having seen Impressionist paintings, we recognize certain things in reality, which we didn't necessarily recognize before um, the 1860s. Uh, so so uh, it, to me, a fine realist painting is a painting that allows me to discover new, thing, new things in the world around me. Mm. Uh, and uh, both uh, Courbet and uh, some Impressionists were very, very powerful painters. They change, they affect the way I see the world after I visit the museum. Hmm. Um, uh, and, the, the, and there are quite a few painters like that who are stylistically very, very different from each other. Uh, then the, uh, what the question you are asking is any painting affecting the way I see the world? Mm, I'm not sure. I'm, I, I, I can't say, I can't give a categorical statement, but I'm not sure. For, so for example, the, uh, the more famous uh, works of uh, Klimt, uh, they, uh, there is a decorative uh, spirit in them so that they, they, they can be very, very uh, beautiful. Um, but I'm not sure, to, to me personally, they, are, they aren't realist. Mm. Uh, they are about manipulating uh, figures and textures into a particular kind of um, uh, ingenious decorative scheme. Um, I, uh, I don't think that they, the Klimt's paintings are about looking at 
those figures. They are not necessarily about uh, looking at those textures on the clothes. They are, they are more about manipulating different elements of reality into uh, this um, visual concoction. I love the what you started with. I think I think there's something so beautiful there. Um, I'm going to try to rephrase it and uh, tell me if I'm getting it wrong. Mm -hmm. Essentially, you're, you're coming up with a really beautiful definition of, of realism here, I think, which goes something like this. So reality is too big for any device to capture in full. So de decision and selectivity uh, is kind of inherent to even experiencing reality. Therefore, we must... Uh, concede that we are always seeing reality through some sort of filter. And realisms would be the, the, the different kind of styles of painters who fall under real, the realism umbrella could be suggested filters. I go see a Monet show, I come out and I see the world through the eyes of Monet, through the filter of Monet. Or I go to a Courbet show, I walk out, I see the, I see the world through the eyes of Courbet. It's very different to go to a Klimt show and go out and then see the world through the eyes of Klim. Same, same goes for Matisse. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so I think that's a really quite a beautiful way to think about it. I hope I didn't mis misinterpret what you said, but I think that's, that's genius. I, I, th I think you're, you're spot on. It, um, I, I didn't, did not intend to say that a paint, paintings by Klimt uh, will not affect us. They will definitely affect us and we may discover uh, certain wonderful, beautiful things in the world through the experience of looking at Klimt. Uh, but uh, I personally don't feel that uh, his work is so much about uh, looking at reality and figuring it out. Mm. Um, in the 20th century, uh, to me personally, one of the great realist painters is Giacometti. Really? That is fascinating. Uh, yes. Do tell, do tell. Yes, yes. Uh, do his paintings look like reality? Do figures look like Giacometti paintings? Well, absolutely not. However, uh, uh, paintings by Giacometti con convey a certain kind of experience of reality in a profound and powerful way. Uh, there is a tremendous amount of space in his works. Uh, I'm not talking about the sculpture so much, uh, mainly paintings and uh, many, many drawings. Um, the the uh, figure in a Giacometti painting uh, looks like a Giacometti sculpture, it doesn't look like a figure in my studio, uh, but the space around that figure is absolutely real. And having looked at, uh, let's say, at a reproduction of a uh, Giacometti painting, um, before I move on to my canvases, definitely affects the way I experience the uh, environment and the physical space of my studio. Mm, fascinating. Did you see the movie that they made about him recently? No, no, I haven't. Oh, it was pretty good. It was pretty good. So I, 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 read, I read the. I, so I read the book. It's based on. <laughs> so this this is this is really fascinating, and and I really love this. Um, this way of this way of uh, defining realism. I almost didn't expect to come up with a definition that I'm going to be happy with by the end of this conversation, but you know, exceeding expectations. So let's let's poke at it a little bit more. I'm thinking this is actually a really beautiful way to also touch back on what Courbet was was trolling against, because even if you look at you go see uh, an exhibition of Jacques Louis David paintings, it's very difficult to kind of step out into the world and imagine the world through the eyes of Jacques Louis David because everything there is so theatrical, so staged, so mm -hmm. detached from the way reality um, ever presents itself to us. But what about somebody like Van Gogh, who is not commonly thought about as a realist painter, but I feel like when I see a bunch of Van Gogh paintings, you know, the world lo starts looking like a Van Gogh painting, at least in my head. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, to me, I, uh, um, he, he's a really, really complex painter uh, and um, often very difficult to talk about. Not as difficult to talk about as Cezanne, but very, very uh, challenging uh, subject for conversation. 
Uh, to me, uh, Van Gogh is an arch realist painter. Um, again, uh, in an he's a realist in an experiential way, not in an illustrative way. Mm -hmm. um, now, uh, and when we talk about Van Gogh, we have to be specific because in his very, very short career, he has uh, uh, moved through a number of phases. Uh, his latest work uh, are, to me personally, are more expressionist than realist. Uh, they are really about him uh, as much as they are about reality. Mm. Um, up to a certain point, um, uh, his works to me are highly realist because they are so experiential. So, uh, I mean, he, he's, he's not the best illustrator of trees. We don't, uh, we, uh, we, um, uh, um, we don't look at Van Gogh painting uh, in order to uh, improve in our gardening skills. <laughs> uh, but 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 uh, when when I uh, looked at his uh, orchard painting uh, in the Van Gogh Museum, it was uh, mind blowing. I could physically uh, feel myself walking from one um, uh, tree trunk to another tree trunk. Mm -hmm. I could physically feel the uh, uh, sharpness of the blades of grass. Uh, I could physically feel how distant the horizon uh, is. He's a very, very physical painter, uh, uh, both in, in, a, um, uh, in a literal way and in a, in, a, in a metaphoric way. Now I'm focusing on the metaphoric aspect of physicality. I can see myself walking in his paintings because the distances are so clear. It's very, very clear what's uh, closer to me, what's further away. Uh, when his painting form would be, a, whether it's a peasant or a tree or, um, uh, or, or, or a small house, uh, they have weight. Mm -hmm. And it's an experiential thing. So, uh, so a... a uh, a painting of a pe peasant who has weight is more realist to me than a painting of a peasant who has texture. Mm, interesting. So would you say, I think you, you in passing, you said something like uh, looking at reality and trying to figure it out. Uh, so would you say that some, some, some of this, um, basically the, the difference between the early work of Van Gogh and the late work of Van Gogh is whether or not he's trying to figure out the stuff outside or figure out the stuff inside? Um, yeah, yeah, I think I think that he was uh, uh, using um, extremely unconventional methods to express the stuff outside. Uh, so like the the like the 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 thick paint, the saturated color in uh, his uh, later work, not the latest work, but in his later work, uh, this saturation and this physicality, this three-dimensionality of brushstrokes uh, give a greater sense of weight and presence to the forms that he's looking at. But in, and towards uh, the very, very uh, end of his uh, life, uh, these methods, they kind of they rebelled against reality and uh, and uh, started to be more and more expressive. They they became more about themselves and more about the uh, personal experience of Van Gogh. Less, mm. uh, uh, they, they were no longer the situation was no longer there to express form. It was there to be saturated and uh, to uh, to be expressive as a thing in itself, as a visual mm. phenomenon in itself. I'm I'm wondering. This leads me. This leads me to a to a thought. So, would do you think that has anything to do with the status of realism in the contemporary art world? Because it seems to me like the contemporary art world is 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 very strongly focused on uh, artists trying to express what's inside, what's my personal experience, what's my story, what am I feeling about this. And not so much about looking outwards and asking ourselves, what is a tree? How does a tree look like? How can I convey uh, my, my, my visual uh, experience of this building? These, these almost feel in, in today's environment like 
these are documentary questions like take take a camera take a photo like why am i even interested in that uh mm-hmm. and we we have this like obsession with the with the inside world do you think that has anything to do with that uh well i i think you're right the the art world has been like that for quite some time for at least a hundred years uh i would say more than that after the uh post impressionist um experiments um painters started to uh 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 paint, paint, painting has become a little bit more self-referential the painting has become about itself uh and uh figures like uh Giacometti uh who retained a very very direct uh communication with the outside world uh are uh, really solitary figures uh some are better known some are um, obscure Uh, the beautiful thing to me uh, in, in this whole discipline of painting is that there are always outsiders. Uh, and some, sometimes, uh, sometimes uh, um, there are, to me, there are the most interesting characters. Mm, it's, not, it's not that mainstream is necessarily boring. Uh, it can have, you know, we, we, we can see wonderful things on the, in the mainstream. Uh, but the outsiders are the ones who are Uh, really interesting and in the 20th and in the 21st century uh, looking at reality and figuring out how to represent it is definitely the job of outsiders <laughs> um, a, and a, uh, um, the a, another paradoxical thing about painting is that uh, is that uh, looking at the world uh, does not go against individuality Uh, Giacometti is uh, one of the most peculiar painters, although I don't think uh, he was trying to express himself. Interesting. Would you say the same about Lucien Freud? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, highly expressive paintings uh, uh, um, that have their expressive power uh, that gain their expressive power as a um, uh, product of very, very thorough, dense interaction with uh, visual experience of the artist and uh, the world he was looking at. How does, it, uh, how does this kind of examination take place? I, I know it's a, it's a huge question, but let's say Let's say people are listening to us and they're like, man, I want to get involved. I want to look at reality and really examine it. How, how do they mm-hmm. go about doing it? If they're, if they're, all they've ever done is, is let's say, paint landscapes or, 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 or portraits from, from photographs. How do they start? Mm-hmm. Uh, I think there, there, uh, it's, there, there, there are two or three different starts and, uh, and two or three processes that can go on uh, concurrently. Uh, first, look at paintings. Uh, mm-hmm. So that, that's, that's also an answer to one of your previous questions. What kind of tips would I have? What kind of practical tips would I have? The most practical tip is look at paintings, um, especially when you can uh, see the real thing, uh, not a reproduction. Um, uh, so, 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 um, uh, paintings, uh, and, and try to, and as you are looking at paintings, try to figure out what they are about, okay? Because, uh, I, let, let's say, um, um, uh, Lucien Freud, uh, and, uh, Bacon, Francis Bacon, painted the same, uh, sitters on, okay, on one or two occasions. Uh, if, I, if I'm not mistaken, or mm-hmm, let's say self-portrait, self-portrait by Francis Bacon and a portrait of Bacon by, uh, by uh, Lucien Freud, um, uh, the, the, uh, these would be, the, these, these are very, very different paintings, uh, and they are about different things. So if we want to look at, a, uh, to study art, well, we'll look at a painting and say, wow, how great it is. What is it about? Okay. Uh, so, so, um, Uh, so for, uh, uh, Lucien Freud is to, 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 to a great extent, he's about mass and he's about surfaces. He is one great realist painter who did uh, give um, major importance to textures. Mm. Okay. Um, so, so once, and so, okay, so we, we discover that this painting is about that wonderful. How did this painting 
arrive at its powerful effect. So if we're looking at the textures of Lucian Freud, how did he express these textures? He didn't copy them. He didn't depict them. It's not about information. It's about how these pain, uh, textures are expressed. Okay? Mm. Um, how space is expressed in a uh, portrait by Giacometti. Okay? Um, we, we, uh, we will not discover how, the how if we don't uh, know what the, we, if we don't feel what the artist was searching for. Mm. So that's one recommendation to look at uh, paintings uh, with a lot of curiosity and asking those questions, uh, those paintings a lot of questions. Mm. Uh, now, what else can we do? Um, draw, make drawings. Uh, make drawings uh, and uh, try the uh, to make those drawings expressive of something. So just like we, when I look at a painting and I ask myself, what does it express? If I take a pencil, I ask myself, what do I want to express in my drawing? Let's say if I want to express form, the three the three dimensional presence of whatever it is that I'm looking at. Well, that gives me direction. And if I, uh, now I don't know how to get there, but I try. And uh, if I have a direction, my trial and error is never in vain. It's, it's useful. It's taking me somewhere. Uh, and uh, step by step, uh, the painting will be more and more expressive of three-dimensionality. Hmm. I'm sorry, the drawing, the drawing. Um, if we take out our colors, same thing. What is it about uh, reality that I want to express using color? Okay. And if I ask myself questions, not knowing the answers, I have no idea how to express light, okay? but this is what I want to do. Okay? Mm. Uh, that gives a direction and it turns the painting process into communication with the reality, as opposed to copying uh, a picture or um, or pretend or looking at reality and pretending that we can copy it literally mm. oh this brings up the obvious question so what are you trying to capture in reality in your work um hmm. it depends on the work uh, uh i i think that um if we go really deep in one direction we uh, discover and express many other things on the way. So, uh, so let's say going back to examples of the famous examples of Lucian Freud and Giacometti, they are not about one thing. There is, there is, uh, there are one or two or three really profound expressive experiences uh, um, uh, inherent in the work. Mm, uh, but and they may have focused on one issue. I don't know. Uh, but the paintings can express many things. So I give myself the permission to, uh, to desire uh, to express more than one aspect of reality in a single painting. Mm -hmm. um, uh, sometimes I would, uh, I would focus on one thing at the expense of another thing. So let's say lately, in my later work, I'm a little less interested in three-dimensionality. I'm more in, interested in emphasizing space. Mm -hmm. uh, in many of my works, I'm uh, quite engaged by the issue of light. Um, and uh, some of my work, uh, oh, and there, there was, uh, um, I almost forgot, uh, one of my recent projects, I was uh, mainly preoccupied with movement. Movement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, not so much the form of the figure, but the movement of the figure, the and dynamics would you of the figure. Would you consider yourself a realist, just uh, for the sake of this conversation? I don't know. Um, I don't know. I th uh, the contact of reality is very, very important to me. Uh, uh, I don't want my work to be entirely conceptual um, uh, or entirely decorative. I, it is very important for me to express certain aspects of reality uh, or a few of them. Uh, but am I a realist? 
I don't know. I think I think uh, I think I have the privilege of not defining myself. And mm-hmm. if uh, if someone wants to do that, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Good answer. Good answer. This uh, this conversation to me it 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 brings it brings to mind. Um, basically, I'm I'm like going going through my my bank of inspirations, and I'm I'm trying to think. Okay, so if we're talking about realism as a kind of honesty driven engagement with what's actually there and 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 trying to communicate it through um i guess through through the eyes of the of the painter something that is not traditionally thought of as, as realist but immediately like shines as a brighting exam bright example in my mind is is fayum portraits what would you think about them in this aspect in this in this context oh they do foo They're like the um, ultimate, right? And they're, <laughs> they're mm-hmm. thousands of years before Corbet even thought about mm-hmm. <laughs> describing mm-hmm. life in that way, but they are, yeah. they're so yeah. honest. Yeah, they are, they are, uh, wow, these are, uh, well, they, they, they are definitely uh, uh, realist um, by my own definitions of the term. They are about light, they are about form, they are about life itself. Uh, these uh, um, faces they uh, they look alive and uh, and uh, what's uh, what can be more real about reality than its aliveness mm-hmm. um, so they, they, they they're really um, uh, ultimate paintings uh, some uh, some of them are more stylized than And uh, more conceptual there are uh, some some for you portraits painted exactly in the same time period uh, as the most realist one can be very very flat and conceptual um, and uh, there is and we, with for you portraits uh, there's we, we get to another paradoxical uh, moment a paradoxical uh, phenomenon in painting that sometimes when real when it's so real it becomes absolute mm. what so, does that mean? So, uh, it, so so uh, it means that it's not just a portrait of one person it's a portrait of anybody so mm. so so the fayum portraits they manage to be highly realist and highly conceptual at the same time yeah it's 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 absolute greatness and i think i think there's also something about Something really important that you brought up in in the question of what the artist was trying to capture and and this this I think is so key and a lot of a lot of people have a lot of trouble with that because to them you know they would look at a Monet and they would say well he was he was trying to paint the river what are you mm-hmm. what do you mean like how am I supposed to know what he was what he was focusing on it look to me it looks like a river so what mm-hmm. are what are some clues that That we can kind of try to find in paintings to to try to decode the mind of the creator mm. um, we don't I, we don't necessarily have an obligation to decode the mind of a creator um, so, so, uh, there, there are some some painters process is documented some painters words are document documented so let's say there there are plenty of records of what Giacometti was looking for in his own words. Uh, and sometimes we don't know so uh, there there are, uh, there are no um, uh, audio recordings of uh, conversations uh, between um, Caravaggio and his studio assistant we don't know uh, but uh, we can look at a painters um, whom we will never meet we will never hear them speak we will never read the Uh, their texts because there aren't any uh, and we just look at the paintings uh, and we try to figure out what they express best mm. Mm, that's that's key I think that yeah. is that is key yeah. because I think also also a uh, perhaps a way perhaps a way to to get into this because for for a lot a lot of people find this really difficult but maybe think about the What parts of narrative information is getting sacrificed and what is what is being gained on the other side? Like uh, uh, if we're to, if you're talking about Caravaggio, 
mm-hmm. a lot of inf- we can say a lot of information in the shadow doesn't exist like if an ear mm-hmm. is in the shadow there is no ear so caravaggio mm-hmm. is happy to sacrifice certain things and then what he what he wins on the other end for for his sacrifices radical um va- value contrast right like darks and lights and the, the feeling of illumination is so powerful and so i think i think some, something at least that i try to do is think okay what has he given up on and then what is he what what is what is he winning on the other side for for that price mm-hmm. that he paid that, that that's a fantastic idea uh very very useful if you want to figure out what the painting is about look for what is not there and then and 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 and, and then you can really answer the question well what does it truly express Mm. So we, 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 we can look at a painting for the wrong reasons. Uh, uh, looking at paintings is, 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 is an art in itself. So, so if, if, um, if I uh, look at um, an impressionist painting, at a, like, let's say I look at Monet in order to learn uh, something about the social uh, structure of 19th century Paris, well, I may discover something but I will mainly miss the point of the painting. Mm. I, will, I, will, I, I, I can learn about certain things through a painting, but is it the best reason to look at it? Because, and, and how can we figure out, well, uh, was Monet the greatest painter who can help us better than anybody if we want to discover something about the social structure of 19th century Paris? No, Tissot okay. is a better idea. Okay, look at someone else. Uh, another paint. Oh, yeah, yeah, for mm-hmm. example. Sure, sure. So, so uh, look at someone else. So uh, now, uh, does it make uh, Monet stupid? Does it make him uh, inept? No, he was more interested in something else. So what is it? Okay, it's not form. His, uh, his, his figures and his trees are not three-dimensional, okay? not so much. So, okay, so it's not that. So what's, what's left? What's left? Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, if we're not sure, we can figure it out. And it's a very, very experiential thing. We, 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 don't even, we don't have to argue, did Monet mean this? Did Monet mean that? No, we just look at the paintings. We try to experience them in an, in an honest way and uh, really uh, discover what we can experience there best and what's not there and uh, what these, what, uh, um, purposes these paintings do not serve so well. Mm. I love it. I love it. Can we can we use this uh, method of analysis to perhaps um, compare two landscape painters? We were talking about Monet, and then let's take Corot, right? So we have very very different uh, visions of the landscape. Both, I would say, under the umbrella of realism. Both trying to investigate and go deep into the vision of what's out there and put them on the canvas. So to the people listening to us right now, you know, you want to look at Corot, that's C-O-R-O-T and uh, Monet, uh, M-O-N-E-T. Put up these paintings right in front of you. You'll see very, very different visual um, visual landscapes being, being conveyed to us, um, arguably looking at pretty similar parts of the world. Uh, so what would you say Monet is looking for that Corot isn't looking for and vice versa? And how does that influence uh, the creation of two different kinds of realistic depictions of the landscape? Mm-hmm. Um, I think in these two particular cases, there are, to me personally, there are more things that are common mm. uh, than things that are different. Interesting. Uh, they, they both were deeply engaged with the atmosphere of the landscape. Uh, they were both uh, looking very, very seriously and inquisitively at uh, the phenomenon of light. Uh, However, uh, living in slightly different um, uh, periods, uh, they expressed uh, those issues in um, their unique ways. Mm. Uh, So so, uh, uh, Monet has allowed himself to destroy form to a far greater extent. Uh, So uh, Monet uh, sacrificed three-dimensionality in a far more extreme way than uh, than, uh, Corot. 
um, a, uh, in Kuro, uh, we see the light on the house. Uh, if, if we're looking at uh, a landscape with some architectural elements, uh, so we, we see a light on a house and we also see the facets of the house, uh, which way the walls go, how, uh, uh, how the house is a three-dimensional structure. We see both. Um, in uh, Monet, we, we see far less of that. We see less tactile structure. We see more atmos uh, atmosphere, um, which we also see in a, in a Corot. Uh, mm. So he he's uh, uh, he 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 had his feet in both worlds. He was he had one uh, one foot in the impressionist world and uh, one foot in the older uh, world uh, world that was more preoccupied with uh, structure, mm. uh, with three dimensional structure. Uh, a um, a Corot uh, has uh, emphasized uh, tone to a greater degree, but it's not to say that Monet didn't. If uh, you uh, take a black and white uh, photograph of a painting by Monet and uh, you increase the contrast just a little bit, it will look very, very similar to Corot and it will look very, very similar to a low resolution black and white photograph of reality. Mm. Uh, so, um, uh, a Corot may have less uh, experiments with um, uh, saturated, unpredictable color. He was more looking at the color of the thing um, and, um, and uh, Monet was less interested in the color of the thing. He was more interested in the color, color of light and atmosphere. Mm -hmm. However, uh, Monet has followed the Corot's advice to keep looking at tones or values. Uh, that was uh, Corot's lesson to the young Impressionist painters. Keep looking at values. And I think, I think uh, Monet um, uh, had uh, a perfect pitch for values, to quote uh, the art critic Kenneth Clark. I love that. I really, I really love that. And especially I love, cause that, that was on my mind as well. The, the thinking about Coro being preoccupied with the color of the thing and then Monet being very busy with the color of the light, right? For Monet, mm -hmm. if there is an orange light outside, this orange light will be reflected um, very dominantly on all aspects of the picture. You will see that orange keep on flickering and for, for Monet, it was like the, the color that is being almost like a blanket on top, on top of the landscape. When for Corot, I, I think it was more about the landscape itself. If it, if I know it's contradictory because of course there has to be a color to the light for us to be able mm -hmm. to see it. But what I'm, what I'm going towards is, and I wonder if you agree, I think that Corot maybe, maybe because, because he looked at it, um, almost like, uh, how to explain it? It's a little bit complicated. I'm going to go the other direction. So mm -hmm. if for Monet, there is a transient moment when the light is very orange and that is what mm -hmm. we're trying to capture, it feels like he's capturing that transiency, the fleeting moment that's about to disappear. When Corot is focusing on the overall value relationships, it feels like he's, instead of capturing a transient moment, capturing something that is timeless. When you look at, at Corot painting like... Um, a hill you could feel like oh that's the hill and that's how it's going to look like forever you know it's not like mm -hmm. that moment on that hill it's like that hill in the archive of things that will stay forever and i think by by focusing on on values as and 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 the, the color of the thing in itself if there was such a thing as opposed to the color that is reflected on the thing you kind of have something like timeless versus fleeting opportunity uh, mm -hmm. That's kind of like the difference that emerges for me when I see these two these these two sets of images. Uh, it's uh, couldn't be more precise. Um, I, I will I will correct myself uh, because I, I think I think I said one thing that was very imprecise. I said about Corot that he was painting the object of the thing. I'm sorry, the color of the thing or the color of the object. It's not one hundred percent precise. So let's say if he's looking, he's painting in Rome and he's painting um, a brick house. 
So the color of the brick in light and the color of the brick in shadow would be completely different. Mm -hmm. So it's not the color of the brick, it's, it is the color of light and the color of shadow. However, in the Corot painting, the color of light and the color of shadow together create a sense of the form of the house, which is, um, I'm, I'm saying exactly the same thing you are saying in a slightly more specified way, mm -hmm. just to make ourselves um, uh, as, as lucid as possible. Um, so, uh, so his Corot is not, look, he's looking at the color of light, but he's not letting the color of light to destroy the thing and its three-dimensionality. Uh, whereas Monet couldn't care less, uh, the form, the 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 forms disintegrate. The three dimension three dimensionality disintegrates, and uh, he had very very good reasons to uh, permit himself that liberty. Oh, I love that, and I think I think that is something that's so important for people to notice because it's, it's extremely counterintuitive uh, to think that the experience of light could compromise a feeling of three dimensionality. This is this is not something that is that is uh, you know you don't you don't you don't imagine that this could be the case, but people have to look at light as a as I think as a far more aggressive agent uh, in our life. Like for example, when you spend a whole day in a museum and it's dim, and then you step outside, not only can you not see three dimensionality, you can barely see anything. You're blinded mm -hmm. by the light uh, mm -hmm. to such an extent that you can barely see the person right in front of you. So I think this is, this is something really important for people to understand that to be true to depicting the experience of light means allowing for the scenario where the experience of light compromises our understanding of three-dimensionality uh, and specificity of object. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So it's almost like, wow, this is so deep. So it's almost like you can, you can either depict uh, the building realistically or the light realistically but uh but you have to choose uh you i mean, think some painters show us that you can do both uh like uh corot in the uh, 19th century and like uh, antonio lopez garcia in the 20th century uh, -huh. uh but uh but um but if you choose to go very very far uh in one direction uh this can be quite admirable so Maybe, if you, sorry, go ahead. You just name dropped my favorite living painter, Antonio Lopez Garcia. Maybe you can, you can, uh, for me, the, the greatest painter alive. And of course, the greatest painter alive who's in the realist business, you could say. Uh, maybe you can, you can expand a little bit about what you think he's doing right or wrong. <laughs> um, well, I, I, I can't speak for him, and luckily he can still speak and paint for himself. Uh, I can tell a little bit about um, my experience of his work, what, uh, what I personally feel they are about to me. Uh, they are about as many aspects of reality as possible. They're mm. about form, they're about space, uh, distances, atmosphere, light and so forth and so on and uh i believe that uh, they're also about texture uh, to some of them uh they're also about that and uh i think that this is the reason that he goes uh he makes tremendous unimaginable efforts uh to paint from life and uh to paint for so long because uh his uh, that degree of expressiveness uh, requires uh, that duration, that uh, laborious process. Uh, uh, he can easily paint all the information uh, we see in his works in a very very short time, uh, but um, uh, he he's not competing with anybody and definitely not with himself uh, um, uh, trying to uh, uh, get first place in the quantity of windows in a single cityscape. Mm -hmm. uh, the, 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 the windows are there, but it's not about them. It's about uh, the experience of light, of uh, space and so forth. Yeah, it's uh, and I, I think to, to me, what makes him 
like so great is is you know i i admired him from from afar since i can remember but the first time and only time that i had the opportunity to see a collection of his work in person is when he had his retrospective in in bilbao mm-hmm. so I, i i i flew to 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 go and see it and what i what i <laughs> what i felt there was like i can i can barely put it into words but if if i try he captured an aspect of reality that i think is is so incredibly profound and that aspect is you see it from afar you think you get it you walk up close it falls apart on you and you don't mm-hmm. get it anymore so just to be a little bit more concrete you um describing it to our listeners we're talking enormous paintings enormous that you look at it from afar It looks like the most re- uh, realistic quote unquote or, or however we want to call it we've we've destroyed all the terminology already but um, representationally convincing um, building or cityscape or whatever it is and then you walk up close and there's none of that there all you see is pretty aggressively applied you know brush strokes and and you see calligraphy sometimes you see like holes in the actual surface scratches and this like amazing um expression of internal existence really so this this actually feels more like life because in life you get that feeling of oh i get it wait what was it oh i i mm-hmm. think i understand it but oops it escapes right there's something about reality that continuously um you know is 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 escaping <laughs> our grasp really so i think he manages uh to an unbelievable Uh, degree of success to capture what reality actually not only looks like but feels like it feels like oh I get it no I don't get it oh it's there oh it's gone and and he manages to put that into artwork which is uh I think the the, the greatest uh, um, artistic um, painterly success of our generation I would say yeah really really uh paradoxical and incomprehensible so uh true to life and uh in um uh in a purely optical way so so yes uh there's a lot of information yes the color looks right quote unquote uh and at the same time uh the surfaces are so uh unpredictable uh there's so much about the material itself not just what that material represents um really he he really ma- tr- manages to marry uh extremes in a single uh in a single work um, um very very aggressive and uh very delicate uh, uh very much about uh the art of painting itself and very much about reality um really profound um and it's uh requires um a fantastic phenomenal human effort Yeah, I feel like I feel like Antonio Lopez is like leaving me speechless. So I think we I, f- I think we covered a lot of ground. Anything we still left on the table? Um, all of art history. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think I think if we've, <laughs> if we've done our part to, to, to make people think about realism a little bit differently, to confuse people, to illuminate the subject, I think uh, we can leave the rest of art history to our uh, perhaps, <laughs> to, perhaps to an upcoming episode. So Ilya, this was super interesting. Thank you so much for taking the time for doing this. I'm sure people will love it. It was a lot of fun, Ken. Thank you. Thank you for joining me. If you enjoy this podcast and would like to see it grow, please take a moment to subscribe, rate it highly, and share it with a friend. If you'd like to become a supporter of the show and have access to exclusive content, please consider signing up as a patron at patreon.com slash Ken Goshen. For online lessons, please visit kengoshen.com slash lessons. Thanks again, and see you next time.